Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our pre-concert talk. My name is Gary Levinson. I am the Artistic Director of the Chamber Music Society of Fort Worth, and I'm thrilled that you're all here in rel relatively lousy weather, although I hear it's getting better, and it's incredibly cold for Texas. But we'll warm your hearts and souls with uh, some really interesting information. Joining me today is our very good friend, Till Mine, from TCU. Please help me welcome him. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. So um, we're going to start uh, with the first piece on the program, and we're going to talk about uh, the Hugo Wolf Serenade. Now, uh, Wolf uh, was relatively unknown in the chamber music circles, and maybe you, you, as a composer, you can speak to how does a leader composer go out and write a serenade like this, which becomes instantly an instant hit, even though with, we have very little experience as a composer with it. Well, I wouldn't, I, as a composer, I can tell you that I enjoy writing in very many different genres, but Wolf I can't speak to except to say that he was a genius, ah. like, like many of these late romantic composers. Um, he is two generations older than Mendelssohn and Schumann, who we will also be listening to. Mm -hmm. But Wolf, I would think, as a, as a genius leader composer, he would be able to be facile in many different areas as well. And something that people ask me all the time is, well, what instruments do you play? Because don't you have to play them to write them? Mm -hmm. And the short answer is no, I don't have to play every instrument, and neither would Wolf. So he, <laughs> he would have figured it out. Wonderful. So w the thing that I always find very interesting about this, when, when I was in my quartets of playing days, everybody was asking for the Wolf Serenade, and very few people actually knew that he was a leader composer. And, and the leader, uh, uh, unfortunately these days, his leader is not nearly as well known, for example, as Schubert's leader. Oh gosh, but they should be, because they're they really, a fantastic indeed. leader. Yeah, so let's listen to maybe the first, uh, first example. Uh, the very first one is, is actually all we have of it because the work is very, very, um, what's the word? It, 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 it sparkles. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's sort of a Tarantella rhythm, even though we, we're not so sure if it is in fact Tarantella. Uh, let's listen to n number one, please. <laughs> So you can see that this is not the most serious music and certainly would never be confused with Schumann or Brahms or anything like that. Now maybe, Till, could you tell us about the work itself and why is it so short? Mm -hmm. Because I hear that he composed some other music that never made it into the final version. Yes, that's true. So um, Vol Hugo Wolf, when he wrote this piece, he was working on other movements as well. And um, so this is the only one that actually emerged as a concert piece that we play. And another portion of a movement, maybe 40 measures worth, was discovered, and it bore the, uh, bore the inscription Tarantella on it, which is supposed to be a, like a folk-like dance in 6-8. But what I found really interesting when Gary and I were talking yesterday over the phone, um, he said, well, this, this movement we're going to hear is a Tarantella. And I said, well, no, it's not, because the other one is a Tarantella. Well, it turns out they were both very similar to each other. And again, this is the only one that, that actually emerged and became the popular piece. And the other one is just somewhere in a dustbin, probably. <laughs> but it's just a single movement. Uh, now, the next piece we're going to hear, though, uh, is a multi-movement multi string quartet. And it's by Schumann. And um, I always like to give the dates of the composers we're talking about, just so you get a sense of when they lived. Schumann was living from 1810 to 1856. Uh, Wolf, by the way, was 1860 to 1903, so he's much later. With Schumann, uh, these three quartets, we have another composer who is um, not particularly a string composer. Naturally, we know he wrote symphonies, um, and then primarily he was a, pian a piano composer because he was a pianist, a concertizing pianist himself, and, and he wrote uh, other leader and so forth. But uh, Schumann, with this, he sat down in 1841, uh, or excuse me, 1842, to write three string quartets simultaneously, the first and the last that he would ever write. They're all under the um, opus number, opus 41, 
and he wrote them simultaneously and apparently intended them to be like a cycle of string quartets that you would play all three one at a time. And so the one that we're going to be listening to is o Opus 41 number one. Apparently he wrote it last, but he intended it to be the first one played. <laughs> Um, so it has a, a imitative opening, which is kind of canonic or fugal in a way. And uh, even though there are romantic harmonies in there, it, to me, it has kind of like a Bach-like feel. And we can talk later about why that might be the case. Let's go to number two, please. It doesn't seem like leader that we we last left left off. It's very very the harmonies are so architectural. What is what what what's the premise here on these quartets? Well, I'll just speak first at least about this movement. I, mm. I, the premise I, I again feel this very Bach like you say uh, architectural. Well, Bach of course was the great musical architect, exactly. and so we hear each of those instruments in that uh, first portion of the introduction, entering one at a time playing the same material. Not exactly a fugue, but maybe more like a canon, like a loosely structured canon. And that kind of imitative texture comes straight out of Bach's type of music. It's just so interesting because if you look at his piano writing, very rarely does he do that in his writing, and certainly in the symphonies, very rarely. But the, 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 the premise I guess I was referring to, you know, is if you look at the program notes, which is so wonderfully written, you know, he was studying the well-tempered clavier, and Till and I, when we were preparing this talk, we were kind of trying to speculate, is he writing this imitative counterpoint to kind of say to people, hey, I can do this too, and I can be really good at it, even though it's not necessarily very popular at the time. Yeah. We need to remember that Mendelssohn, we'll talk about him later, rediscovered Bach in Leipzig only a short, maybe 20, 25 years before this quartet was penned. And so, you know, the audiences of Germany and really of all of Western Europe would have been quite surprised to hear this kind of music that really was not popular, even though Mozart, after Bach went out and wrote fugues and things like that, but it was, there was that period of 60, let's call it 60 years, yeah. where you just were not going to roll out of bed and go out and hear a fugue. When I was younger and I first learned that, I'd always thought Bach was everywhere at all times, you know, ever since he was uh, writing music, he was famous, but that's actually not true. And so that, that period of 60 ish years after his death, People had forgotten about Bach, and so as we'll say later, you know, Mendelssohn rediscovered him. People's tastes change. It's very interesting. We talked about the Mozart piano concertos. In our day, when we were students, everybody wanted to hear the minor concertos, the most dramatic and the most interesting. But in Mozart's time, they wanted to hear all the major concertos. They were the most beautiful and easiest to listen to. <laughs> right. So should we talk about this next example? Yes. The, what we just heard a moment ago with that imitative opening was just an introduction. And then Schumann launches into the real uh, meat of the first movement of the string quartet. Uh, what we'll hear now is a new key. So we'll have, um, isn't that what we're going to do? Yes, transition, the transition to, to F transition major. To, the, to F major. And then this ne the movement itself will be in sonata form, which is, of course, structured so that you have two themes that are that are played, al played around with for an entire movement. Number three, please. So. This is much more along the lines of the Schumann we really expected. Yeah. You know, it's, it's charming and it, it has this wonderful love for Clara, which really pretty much uh, permeates his entire output since he met her. Let's talk about the scherzo. Now, the scherzo in Italian means joke. Um, and the scherzo replaced the minuet and trio right around 
one should we say at the end of Haydn? Yeah, I was looking into that, and I'm. Uh, I would say that Haydn was already writing scherzos, but typically in the classical period, we expect it to be minuet and trio. You know, the, usually it's the third movement of a four movement piece, and it's something light. So you have an A B A structure where you have uh, you, they play something light in the three meter, then something else comes in the middle, and then we hear the first music again. And that basically, this is now what then Beethoven was doing with his scherzos and his symphonic works and other pieces, string quartets. And uh, so Schumann now is using scherzo, but also using the term intermezzo, which is interesting. Yeah, interesting, because intermezzo is, is just kind of what something maybe you would think of as almost a palate cleanser, an aural palate cleanser for the music. And in this intermezzo, it's actually very interesting. I want to talk to you about the stroke you're going to hear. Um, it, the stroke is called ricochet. And the, there's pretty much three st strokes in the string repertoire um, that are off the string. And they're basically designed to articulate for an audience. Keep in mind, in that room, that's, that's his work room. But he's not, he's not really going to have a concert hall even the size of this room. Most of the rooms these quartets would have been premiered and, and listened to would maybe fit 40, maybe 45 people. So the articulation would be not that important, but certainly not the same thing as playing everything on the string. So this is a bouncing stroke that is actually better suited to the new bow the, called the tort bow. The, Baroque bow that, that Schumann would have known, but certainly would not have used, that Mozart used, is a concave bow that, that is bent this way. And the bow that we're all used to is bent this way. So listen to number four to the ricochet stroke in the scherzo. Number four, please. So this is almost a military rhythm, isn't it? Yeah, it is actually. Yeah, and, and he uses the stroke for articulation so that it is not militant. It's actually quite uh, whimsical, if you will, but it does have that wonderful articulation. Yeah, it's in minor, but it still kind of has a light feel because of the ricochet. Exactly. So that's the A section of that movement, but then the B section is the intermezzo, where we might have had the trio from Menuet and Trio in an earlier era. So for this intermezzo, um, something that Gary brought to, to mind the other day was that this is an instrumental term, um, it, but it actually kind of comes from um, opera, the idea of something that comes in between acts, inter, meaning between, of course, and um, so this is like an in-between movements piece, and it's supposed to change the mood. And it does change, because first we're in 6-8 with the scherzo, then we move to 2-2, two, two, which has a more even metric feel, uh, changes keys, and then after the intermezzo plays, we will hear the scherzo again. And interestingly enough, it's in the key of C major, which should be the most comfortable key, no sharps or flats. But it has a real uneasy quality to it, I find. It's not difficult to listen to necessarily, but it's not a comfortable sit back in your chair, C major. Let's hear number five, please. <laughs> So let's go maybe to the slow movement. Yeah. Um, and it's an incredible work, actually. And in some ways, it recalls Beethoven. And everyone w w wants to argue which Beethoven. We kind of hear it as a slow movement of the Ninth Symphony because it has this wonderful regal choral statement in single notes. Beethoven was, was the master of using few notes <laughs> to he the maximum was. effect. <laughs> he was. And, and actually, I think you, if you know the Ninth Symphony well, which I'm sure you all do, when you hear the first uh, three notes of this, the main melody in this slow movement, you can't help but recall the first three notes on the slow movement of the Beethoven. And it actually all connects and makes sense because Schumann is the one who started a new um, uh, publication to, to involve criticism of music and in a, both a good way and a bad way. You know, he was a good critic and he was trying to bring back the music of Beethoven and of Mozart and others, Weber. And um, it, it seems funny to bring back Beethoven because Beethoven was a contemporary of his for a little while. 
Indeed. Well, I think one of the things we, we have to remember that in the connected world we are today, it seems almost impossible that somebody would disappear from the public's eyes. But in Schumann's time, you got all of your information pretty much either by word of mouth or by newspapers and magazines such as his magazine. So if something was published, what is it, once a month or something like that, then it'd be pretty easy to forget if for 12 months nobody played any Beethoven, at least nobody reviewed any Beethoven. It may have been played somewhere else, but not in your town, and so maybe it was not so much in the forefront of your home. Yeah, I, th I think that's a very um, interesting publication for that time, the, the, really the first of its kind, and or one of the first of its kind, but it also was a great way for uh, Schumann to look at other composers, new composers such as Brahms, and to say, we have a genius here. And he used that as a vehicle for showing other composers as well. Indeed. So let's listen to number six, the slow movement that invokes that third movement of the Beethoven Ninth Symphony. I love how he treats the viola here. And I'm a violinist talking. Oh, tell, tell me about it. <laughs> what do you want to say about the viola? Well, you have three voices, including the, the bottom voice, the cello, and they all have exactly the same rhythmic pattern. It's sort of a, a chorale-like motion, very slow. And the viola gets to comment on that motion and say, no, I've got this, I've got... It's almost like a musical guide to the chorale, isn't it? Oh, very good. Yeah. Yes. It's really fun. All right, let's look at our last movement, which, of course, is a complete contrast perpetual motion, and Schumann is notorious, at least in the symphonic world, for writing really, really awkward music, possibly because you saw the picture of him at the piano, he spent a lot of time uh, writing at the piano. Um, and this, this is actually one of the exceptions, I'm not saying it's easy, but it certainly lies a lot better on, in, the, in the fingers, and that motor uh, sort of invokes the, the Beethoven Canzone Opus 132. Um, so, um, sorry, the, the opus uh, 59, number three of the, the quartet. I'm looking yeah. at the wrong notes. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting the way he sort of ends this quartet. Again, we have to remember he's in some ways experimenting. He never wrote a quartet before. And here it is, this wonderful masterpiece that came it, out of his. It's a masterpiece. Uh, this motoric, um, you know, motive that we get here, it, it's very, really exciting. It's an exciting end yes, to this quartet. For sure. Let's listen to number seven, please. It's no, uh, no accident, I should say, that this is dedicated to Mendelssohn because you really hear a lot of his last movements. Certainly the Italian symphony would be one, the Mendelssohn octet, the motor is always running and it's, it's, it's a, and to me it's a Ferrari motor, or maybe in this case a Mercedes <laughs> motor because it's a flawless, has no problems whatsoever, no hiccups here at all. Right. Yeah, and in a way it's kind of, um, well, I wouldn't say Bach-like in the way it's treated, but Bach was, you know, you listen to a lot of his music, it has its own motoric kind of 16th note constant rhythm Maybe as well. Maybe like the symphonias for keyboard. Yes, very true. And by the way, <laughs> I have to say the previous slide we were just looking at reminded me of my childhood because I was there in the Schumann house when I was like really, really young. And so it brought back memories. Really nice wood on the <laughs> floors there. I'm a fan. So let's maybe move on to Mendelssohn. Yes. And talk a little bit about... Uh, well, the genius of Mendelssohn, and, and actually in some ways the tragedy of Mendelssohn because he was such a child prodigy, wrote the octet at age 16, Midsummer Night's Dream, you know, some of the very greatest works long before the age of 20. Um, and this st string quartet is, actually takes after a song. Tell us about it. Uh, well, this song is uh, Ist es wahr from Opus 9, which is an, an early set of songs. And when he wrote this quartet, he was only 18 years old. And we think, well, gosh, an 18-year-old writing something this deep 
but he was already, uh, I mean, he's halfway through his life at this point. He know? didn't know that at the time. He, did, he didn't know that, that's true. I, my wife made that point earlier that's today right. to me. But, but, it, uh, but this is a very precocious and brilliant composer. And of course, he's not just a composer, he's also a conductor, and he's the one who brings Bach back into the limelight. His talent is really mind-boggling. Let's start with the fact that he had an incredible musician in his household. His sister Fanny Mendelssohn was one of the very great pianists of her time. Um, and then of course he played violin and he played piano and, and he was also very fortunate in that he had an orchestra in the house. <laughs> you know, his grandfather, yeah. Moses Mendelssohn, was a very wealthy banker and, and they had a really nice place to live in Leipzig and then he had a, an orchestra so he could actually experiment with a lot of these works, including the chamber music. Right. So um, he, he was able to, to have people in the house and experiment with songs like that. So why don't we hear the song yeah. first? This is example number eight, please. Eight. Is the song So pure leader and something that's so wonderfully intimate in this picture is such an intimate picture as well. So let's move on to the quartet. And the, the, the introduction is quite slow. Um, and we do hear this introduction, but the way he treats the strings, he's just a master of the instrument because he's able to get the color of the strings. And what I love about it is the viola commenting with those long E's on the introduction. So the vocal quality of the instruments, I mean, in the end, I was always taught the reason they, these, all of these instruments were invented is to imitate the great voice. And I think in this case, Mendelssohn does a wonderful job showing us how to do it. Let's do number 10, please. Number nine, number nine. So that was, that was clear, hopefully to all of you as well, that that's the tune coming straight from the, from the, the lead that he had written. And I, I think we've mentioned this before, but uh, was it Stravinsky who said, great composers borrow, and good composers borrow, great composers steal. There you go. He stole from himself at that point. <laughs> and so the great composers also steal from themselves. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, th this is such an interesting thing too, because when we were talking about this, uh, you know, when you talk about chamber music, the, Probably the most famous song that became a piece of chamber music is Di Forel and the Trout Quintet, and written by Schubert some years later. But I mean, this is such an incredible testament to the human voice using four instruments. It's really beautiful. Um, our next example is the Allegro, the first melodic idea. It's a dotted rhythm, and it's got a lot of imitative uh, uh, counterpoint, mm -hmm. doesn't it? And it, it's, it's very interesting that it has Mendelssohnian's lightness, yeah. but sort of the structure of Beethoven, and, and also a, a certain urgency to it. What, what, do you, what do you feel about this, this kind of oh, structure? I, no, I think you, you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, you, a lot of times when you hear Mendelssohn, you know it's Mendelssohn because of the textures and the sort of the lightness of the music. But at the same time, you still have this urgent um, romantic feel that I think comes straight out of Beethoven. And, and everyone writing at this time, these Germanic composers, are directly influenced by Beethoven. In fact, overshadowed by the ghost of Beethoven, basically. And speaking of ghosts, we should remember that Leipzig was always a city of Bach. And it's got the St. Thomas Church, it's got the, the great statue. So I think that even in his short lifetime, Mendelssohn was very well aware that Bach was, he, let's put it th this way, Mendelssohn was a great talent, but Bach built Leipzig. Right. <laughs> so yes, let's hear number 10, please. So now we're going to turn to the intermezzo. Yes, uh, the famous intermezzo. A different intermezzo. Yes. Before we were talking about the Schumann, 
Um, and uh, I want you to say something in a minute about the, the texture here, but okay. I'll just start by saying the structure. So with the, with the Schumann, he used the intermezzo as the middle section, the B section in the ABA. And here, Mendelssohn has turned that around and the intermezzo is the outer sections, and then he'll have an allegro di molto in the middle of that so yes. structure. For me, this is an incredibly interesting intermezzo because unlike the other intermezzi we spoke about, this is really an aria in some ways. You have one instrument singing a song and then the other three accompanying in pizzicato. So in a way, the motion of this is very medieval, rather like a troubadour who'd be walking around with people accompanying him and he's telling the story and invoke, you know, inviting all of you into his world. So let's hear number 11, please. Incredibly simple, but so beautiful yeah, and so beautiful. poignant music. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in the last movement, uh, so we have more scherzo-like uh, writing, right? But uh, in, it's more decisive here in this, the end of this intermezzo. What, what about the Allegro di Molto? So the Allegro di Molto is the, uh, the middle section, this B section that I've been talking about in between the two intermezzi. And uh, this one, I, to me, to my ear, it reminded me of a uh, scherzo that we heard a couple concerts ago, uh -huh. just maybe because it had a little bit of that almost a ricochet feel yeah. in, in the middle of it. And so I was, I was reminded of the Schubert scherzo from quartet number one that we heard the other, or from 12 rather, 15. You know, we could actually talk about the different kinds of scherzos. I'm always struck that Beethoven's scherzos and then even some of the scherzos written by Brahms after him are rather dark. And, and you know, we have to remind ourselves that the term actually means joke. So I can't tell if Beethoven just thought it was a really dirty joke or what. But certainly Mendelssohn and Schubert and Schumann here, they, there's no question about the fact that they're not trying to write any sort of storm into these jokes. They really are lighthearted, wonderful sort of foils for the rest of the work. And he really plays around with the rhythm a lot in this movement, which I love. It, it actually reminds me of Brahms, who will come later, uh, a couple, you know, generation later, but there, there's this obscurity of the beat where you're just not sure where to tap your foot exactly, and it's a, actually a wonderful feeling. It must have been very difficult on the audience too, because you know, we have to remember that a lot of these quartets would be, have been played in people's homes, and so if you're moving something at a quick meter and, and you're off by one sixteenth note, I can imagine these rehearsals <laughs> with amateurs trying to spend hours and hours to just line it up would be a problem. Uh, yeah. Should we listen to that one? Let's do it. That's number 12. So it's very fleeting and very quick. In a way, it invokes the term the hemiola, but most hemiolas are much slower. So a good example of hemiola would be a six, eight that is suddenly in three. So instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, it'd be doing one to two and three in. Exactly. So you have a very different meter, and to yeah. do it in this tempo is very difficult. Yeah. And by the way, that wasn't an example of ricochet. That was more tremolo. That this is actually spiccato. Spiccato. Spiccato, okay. yeah. And, and it, it's, it's very interesting that we keep going. Um, you might be wondering, why do we keep going between French and Italian terms? You know, somebody like even Copeland will go between French, Italian, and English terms. Yeah because everything is a trifle of something else. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Debussy is all French. <laughs> indeed. Uh, a lot of, of the German composers certainly would be taught to write in Italian terms, but the strokes we're talking about, many of them were developed through the Franco-Belgian school around 1850. So we talk about the technique sometimes in French terms, and then of course we talk about the music in Italian terms. Right. Let's go to the last movement. The finale is, is yeah. a, the recitativo. It's a very sort of a, a, a tense violin solo, isn't it? Um, yeah. And, and, and it, 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 tell us about the harmonies here. Well, the, the harmonies of this, it's really a recitative that we're going to hear. And to me, it brings to mind yet again the music of Bach. So I imagine these recitatives in his cantatas and oratorios where you have these diminished seventh chords. And a diminished seventh chord is just about as dissonant as you can get in tonal music. You have uh, you know, an outer interval that's very dissonant and every interval inside is dissonant as well. And it's a way to bring out the emotion. 
And it sounds to me like there's supposed to be a, a singer there, that, that the, the uh, violin is singing and it's trying to give us a message, a very intense message. The texture and then the, the range of the violin is, is right in the range of a good soprano. So I think this would, be, this would have obviously been a terrific choice for Mendelssohn, who knew singers and obviously yeah. knew the instrument. Um, and you mentioned something to me, sorry to interrupt, but you mentioned something to me the, uh, the other day about it, that it, was, it always comes back in the violin. And that, to me, seems more, even more evidence that this is a character that he's trying to have the violin play. Exactly, and it would be a, maybe a way that one could follow the quartet structurally without having the score in front of them. It'd be something that would be really interesting for the audience to hang on to. And then, of course, the violinist, you know, the first violinist always gets to be the star. <laughs> and this is a great, great opportunity for him. Let's, let's hear number two, uh, 13. 13, please. Yeah. Something, uh, the, another thing we talked about er earlier was uh, Gary said to me that he thought that this was over-dramatized and that maybe it's supposed to sound, uh, maybe, maybe comic is the wrong word, but just too well, much. Well, I would say more of a, like a soap opera, you know, like an oh, opera yeah. buffa. I mean, right? basically the idea that, that Mendelssohn would not be capable of writing real drama is ridiculous because <laughs> right. he's spent his whole career being able to create just about anything at a very, very high level. But here, I think what he's trying to do is invoke what Weber may have invoked in, in, in an operetta or something that you might, might get in Merry Widow some years later. Um, this is supposed to make us feel that, hey, this is not real tragedy at all. It's just excitement. That's why you, you spoke about tremolo. The three strings the three lower strings are using tremolo for the effect because if they were to sustain something, they just would not get enough noise out of it. And you would, it doesn't sound very exciting to sustain one note as in the time of Bach if you had, you, you know, a basso continuo, for example. Plus that agitation adds to all the tension that exactly. we have. Yeah. So then the last thing we'll hear is um, the, the, the continuation of the finale here. The recitative is played more than one time. It comes back again in the violin. And then um, toward the end of this piece, there's a wonderful section that is a fugue. And it's just such a beautiful, once again, Bach-like way of creating uh, this texture where each instrument gets to play the same melody one at a time. And the counterpoint is just beautiful. And then finally, what I find surprising about this piece is that he comes back to the ist es va kind of song material. And uh, it's more subtle, so you might not catch the, the tune, but he for the last two and a half minutes of the piece, it's just very quiet and calm, almost yeah. unexpected. Exactly, for a finale, which you would think would be this explosive, wonderful thing, he actually comes back in, and I think it's because of the leader. Let's hear number 14, please. <laughs> So basically, this is sort of a bookend ending both to our talk and to the program, but the roads leading to Italy, I think you hear from these examples, and I know you'll hear during the concert, that you have two German composers and an Austrian composer that really understood the vocal quality of Italian um, writing and really the, the culture. And I, I think that you'll really enjoy this. Thank you, Till, very much. Thank you so much. And enjoy this. Thank you. Thank you.